all survived. <laughs> if you weren't here yesterday, it was a small party. Packed <laughs> house. Very grateful for that extra hour of sleep. <laughs> Who do you respect? Like really, truly. Who do you have just a deep and abiding respect for? And why? I've been thinking a little bit about John Wycliffe this week. It was his feast day on Thursday. He's one of the folks on our saints calendar who probably did not expect to end up there. Our friend John was, as uh, St. Wikipedia says, <laughs> in a lovely turn of phrase, an influential dissident. In the Roman Catholic Church in the 14th century in England, in Oxford, is where he taught in particular. He was a priest who spent most of his life as a professor. Uh, his group of followers were known as the Lollards, if you've heard of them. And he was noted for his anti-clerical and pro-biblical reforms. Just a hundred years before the official Reformation gets rolling. He's perhaps best known for translating the Latin Vulgate Bible into English. We still have white Bible translators, if you've heard of them. Because he believed Horrifyingly, that people could have an experience of God unmediated by a priest. And worse, <laughs> that people could and should read their Bible in their own language at home. Unmediated by a priest. <laughs> he believed that an individual person's holiness was more important than their office, which meant that being a holy lay person was better than being a wicked cleric. I suspect he had insider knowledge of this being a cleric. <laughs> But I know now, it doesn't sound particularly radical. Right? Of course, you should and can read your Bible at home without being present. <laughs> to tell you what I mean. Of course you can pray without a priest. Of course you have access to God outside the sacramental life of the church. Thank you for pointing out the faithful obvious, shall we? But during his life, John Wycliffe was condemned for these views, particularly for his views on what happened at communion and around transubstantiation. And after his death, he was condemned as a heretic. They burned his writings. They dug up his body crushed his bones, burned the rest, and scattered the ashes in the river swift. That's how terrified they were of these ideas. They refused to let anyone have a place to pray near where his body was. In case those ideas seeped on the ground, contaminated them. And now, John Wycliffe has a feast day <laughs> in a reformed Catholic church. I don't know if I can communicate how unlikely this is. <laughs> For a priest, though not someone he would recognize as a priest, for starters, the wrong gender, <laughs> to be celebrating in a Reformed Catholic Church a saint day 
for John White. Highly improbable. Divine sense of humor. Dostoevsky once said, men reject their prophets and slay them. They love their martyrs and those whom they have slain. What is it about us that we love radical visionaries once they're dead? A good friend of mine, Don Greenwood, is a retired priest, just solid, good, and faithful servant. He was here yesterday, and he told me the story of his grief on the day when Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. He was serving in a parish in Ohio, and that night was their vestry night. So he comes to church, overwhelmed with this event in the nation. He showed up and found his vestry mostly relieved, verging on glad that that troublemaker was taken care of. Maybe it shouldn't have happened quite so violently, but the overwhelming sensation was one of relief. Who do we respect? And why? Who's respectable? We have Jesus cautioning us strongly in today's Gospel reading about anyone who's considered a respectable citizen, who sits on admirable boards, who's esteemed in the community, people who attend worship regularly, pillars of the community. I don't know about you, but I like a nice pair of heels, I like a nice wine, I wear a fancy costume that tells everybody I'm a priest. I like it when people respect my authority. So I don't know about you, but I feel maybe more than a little condemned by this reading. Jesus is inviting us into a really different world than the one we're just cruising in most days. Sometimes we talk about the radical equality of this vision or a flattening. But there's a strange thing where actually what he says is that there's still, there's going to be a high, exalted, and a low, humble, but the roles are going to be swapped. There's still going to be servants, just different servants. It's a sticky place in this. Who do we respect? And why? What we learn from the example of John Wycliffe is that sometimes, maybe even often, those voices that are the most out there, the voices, the ones with the crushed bones, do someday just become the unconscious default assumption of many. Of course we can pray without the mediation of the priests. Of course, we can read our Bibles ourselves in our homes. Which makes me think there's something holy about that irritation. That thing that disrupts respectability. I remember being in seminary and one of the worship professors was a Baptist. We were studying Baptist polity and worship. And he was talking about Baptist worship and about the phenomenon where if something strange or unexpected happens in Baptist worship, everybody sort of perks up, like, ooh, maybe it's the Holy Spirit. And I, my Anglican sensibilities, no, if something disrupts worship, you ignore it. <laughs>
harmful beliefs cause real violence. I'm talking about those people who just bother us. For myself, those people are often the people who have something that I want, who are a way in the world that I'm not brave enough to be yet. So I condemn them for wanting too much too soon, too loudly, too angrily, or going about it in a way that I don't find respectful. Yet often, a few years later, I'll find that what they were saying in the way that I didn't like has become one of the default assumptions of my life. And I find that I respect them a great deal. There's a couple things happening. Teach us what we need to know. 